trust is representing our conversion. Okay? But let's, let's not call that something other than discipleship. Because when Jesus says, and I want you to open in Matthew 28, that's where we're going to be working from today. When Jesus comes to his disciples on the mountain to where he directed them, this is Matthew 28, verse 16. It says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Which is really good news <laughs> for us. <laughs> I mean, they, they just, when they were with Jesus for three and a half years, they saw him die, buried, risen, and they're still doubting. Which, you know, I think for me that's encouraging. So when I still go, I know I'm in big company. And Jesus, Jesus' word to them is that he doesn't necessarily rebuke them for their doubt, and he reminds them of who he is, which we're going to get to in just a second. Jesus came, he says, that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And that's important before you get to the commission, because he's grounding it in himself and his work, who he is and what he's done. Then he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So when he says, go and make disciples, what Jesus is not saying is, go to all the people that already believe in me and help them grow up in, in me. That's not what he's saying. He is talking about people who don't know the gospel, who haven't heard about what Jesus has done, or haven't come to believe that what he did, did he did it for them, that they might be reconciled to God. So that's what he's referring to. So when we talk about discipleship, if it doesn't include evangelism, we're not, we're not talking about a discipleship Jesus was talking about. So I, my sense is, discipleship has been called for spiritual formation of the Christian. And I think that's truncating it. It's, it's a broken view of it. It's not complete. And so, we need to see evangelism as disciple-making. And maybe it's better to get rid of discipleship and just call it disciple-making. Because the Bible doesn't use that word discipleship. It does use the word make disciples. So, the phrase make disciples. So, maybe that's part of what we need to do. I don't know. I've been wondering if we need to come up with some new language in this new day to help clarify what we mean when we say things. But, uh, for the sake of not being able to do that, when I say discipleship, I mean disciple-making. But then, as we talked about last night, if you're going to make disciples of Jesus, what you're doing is you're going to continue to do evangelism to believers. Meaning, you're going to herald the life, death, resurrection, ascension, and sending of the Spirit. So you're going to still herald the truths of Jesus in order to build people up into Jesus. You, you don't give them something other than Jesus to build them up into Jesus. And what I think we've done, like I shared last night, is I think we've substituted spiritual disciplines for discipleship into Jesus. And that's a danger. Disciplines are, are important. I'm not getting rid of them. I'm just saying the goal is that you might get them to Jesus. The goal is that you might form them into Christ's likeness. That they might become into, uh, people that are restored to the work God called them to do. So they're a means to an end. They're not the end. The end is Christ's likeness. And the only way you get to that end is making sure every discipline is pointing to Jesus, leading them to Jesus, helping them to conform to the image of Christ. So we want to keep giving them Jesus because it's by Jesus that we're transformed. In other words, think of it this way. The gospel is good for not only our justification, but our sanctification and glorification. That's the past, present, future reality of the work of God. That he is at work in us. To both to do the will and to do according to his good pleasure, that he is the author and perfecter of our faith, that he's the beginning and the end, and everything in between. So that's what I meant when I said this, in case you get a little hung up on that. Okay, now I want to go into that a little bit further now in, in terms of how we break that down. Um, but before I go any further, does, does this make sense? Or do you have any questions? Yes, sir. That was good. You got it? Okay. Good. And so here's the deal. This is my deep conviction and what I hope to devote most of my, the rest of my life to. I would like to see the church have, uh, and maybe, I don't know if it restores the right word, but I would like to see it become normative for every believer in the church to become gospel fluent. That every believer can speak the truths of the gospel into absolutely every aspect of life. That's what I think a mature Christian looks like. They can apply the truths of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension, and sign of the Spirit into every aspect of life. Sex, marriage, kids, money, work, play, rest, you name it, everything. Now, I think the gospel applies to everything. And so to help people be able to do that is what I want to give my life to. Because I believe...
believe that's the best way to make much of Jesus. Because if Jesus has to, has to do with everything, and if Jesus can actually change everything, then we're talking about Jesus' kingdom, which means his rule and reign is, is actually over everything in life. And that's the way he's going to get greatest glory and fame. And he's only Lord of our worship services and our Bible studies and our meetings together, but the world doesn't have a clue how it affects their life in the everyday. They were, we're really missing on the power of the gospel to affect life. And so when I talk about discipleship, I'm using that assumption when I talk about it. Okay, just, just, I want you to understand, I'm not going to talk a lot about how do we work out the spiritual discipline. I'm going to talk a lot more how do we work the gospel into every aspect of life. The spiritual discipline is being a great means by which we can do that. So, and I'm going to erase this. As we look at the Great Commission, there are, I, I've come to kind of grasp on the four key questions I think we should teach Christians to ask of everything. Uh, and, I, and I think you'll see this kind of throughout the scriptures. First of all, who is God? If you want to think about it here, these are the attributes of God. Okay? In the best form, it's just theology, a okay? study of who God is. Okay? Uh, then, who is God? What has he done? This is, and I want to say in particular, this is, by the way, the actions or activities of God. Okay, so the attributes, let's call it actions, since it's still in the word. Actions. And in this sense, we most fully see who God is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus says. So the pinnacle of who God is seen in his actions is Jesus Christ. Now, we see it throughout all the scriptures, and every, everything that God ever does is congruent with who God is. So you always can know what God's like by watching what he does. But Jesus is the fullest expression of, the, of seeing what God is like in bodily form in action in everyday life. So we want this, in some ways, the best way to think about this is its best form is Christology. So we've got theology, we've got Christology. In terms of, we see the, the sent, anointed one of God showing us what God is like in action. In incarnation. Okay? So what has God done? And then, who are we? This is this is really comes down to our identity, which I'm going to talk about in this session. So our identity. Uh, and I think this passage has a lot to say about that. So who are we? And this is, I think, absolutely important because if you define ecclesiology, your ecclesiology, your study of the church, primarily by what the church does, then I think you have a works-based ecclesiology. But if you primarily define the church by who she is, because of what God has done, then you have a gospel-centered understanding of ecclesiology, and then what comes out of that is our actions. But you've got to get that order right. Okay? So that's the last question. What do we do? What do we do? And here's kind of how, and this, this would be our actions. And I, let's just call this obedience. Here's how the order works. And I'm going to draw a line here because these are the indicatives. These are what are always true. And these are the imperatives, how we work out what is true in the everyday life. And this is how I believe gospel-centered life looks. As we move from this side to that side, not this side to this side. And we don't go, we go from your look, we go from left to right, not right to left. And, and what, what we have is this is a biblical theology, by the way. Because what do we have? In the beginning was God. God. Yeah, don't John 1, do Genesis 1. So in the beginning was God. Okay. And what does God do? God creates. What do we know about who God is from what he does? Who is God? He's creator. Okay, so we know God's creator from what he does. He creates. What are we? Who are we? Adam and Eve, who are they? Okay, they were created beings, right? And in particular, how are they different than the rest of creation? They're image bearers. Okay? And what does God say about them? Very good. Okay? This is, this is, this is where we stand now in Christ Jesus. We're going to, because we're the new creation. We have a position of being new image bearers of God. With a, we are in our being, new man, is, wants to do what's good, Paul tells us, but we're 
we're fighting with the old nature that doesn't want to do what's good, but that's a war we're dealing with right now. Uh, but we, we are, God calls us good in Christ Jesus. And we're going to move forward now, so it's a new creation reality. But in the old one, we got created image bearers that are very good. What are they to do? You guys know this. Okay, they're to, they're to exercise dominion, so rule, subdue. They're to be fruitful and multiply. To bring glory to God. Okay, they're to glorify God. They're image bearers, so they're supposed to show the world what He's like and what they do. What was that? Okay, so they're to obey God. And in this case, it's to not eat of the particular tree. Okay? Now, obey God, what does that tell us about who God is? God is ruler. Yeah, he's Lord, he's in charge. And so what has he done? He's given a rule. And okay, what does that mean we are? We're subjects. Okay? And they're supposed to obey. And that's the pattern. That's, that's how the move works. And whenever we teach people about what they're to do, if we don't do this work, we end up leading them into moralism. Okay? We don't lead them into a Godward life that trusts in the work of God. We lead them into a man-centered life that trusts in the work of man. Here's how it works. We move from who God is, what He's done, and who we are, in other words, our being, leading to our doing, and we reverse it. We say our doing makes us who we are. What we do equals who we are. And this is all, this is the world. You know, when you meet someone, tell me about yourself. You know, who are you? I'm a plumber. No, I didn't ask what you do, I asked who you were. And we, don't, we don't define ourselves by who we are, we define ourselves by what we do in the world. Why? Because the serpent came along to Adam and Eve, remember? They said, he said, if you eat of this tree, God knows in the day that you eat of it, in other words, what you do, eating, he knows that when you do it, you will become like God. In other words, you'll have a new identity. Your doing will give you your being. You eat, you become. You do, you are. That's what certain serpent is now seeping into the world system. That what you do makes you who you are. So he reverses the order. He says, if you do, you will become like God. Then you can determine good and evil. Therefore, you're the rule, ruler around here. You're the rule setter. So in other words, you become God. So your doing leads you to overtake God's doing. That's, that is the pattern of sin, by the way. Just, it just turns it over, around on, on, the other, on the other side. Starts over here and goes that way. This is why we have to be so careful in our leadership at churches to not spend all of our time over here. But how much of our teaching and our leadership is, people, this is what we need to do. Lacking all of this, this is what God's done, this is, this, is, this is who He is, this is what He's done, this is who you are, out of that will flow what you do. And if you pay attention to Paul's writings, when he corrects, he does this. Let me tell you about God, who chose you for the creation of the world, to make you His children. Therefore, love one another as dearly loved children. That's the order Paul moves in. And every time that they're not walking in line with the truth of the gospel, he goes back to who God is, what He's done, and who they are in Christ, as He then leads them to the life that they ought to live. But He will not just tell them what to do without focusing on who God is and what He's done. This is a very important movement in your leadership to get this order right. Because you want people to be grounded in theology, Christology, and ecclesiology, which will lead to their missiology. And when you think of missiology, it is active obedience accomplishing God's purposes in the world. We've got to get rid of the idea of missiology is everybody who goes to another part of the world, those are missionaries, and the rest of us, <coughs> we don't know what we are. We're supporters, we're prayers. No, you're missionaries too. You've been saved by God for the purpose of working out the works He prepared in advance for you to do, and He put you in place with His purpose in mind for the place He has so that He would work out His purposes through you in that place. That's a missionary. We're going to talk about this identity now in just a sec. But I don't want to go any further past this because what I did last night was largely here. Hey, I was talking about the gospel, what God has done in the personal work of Christ, and what that means for us. That's what I was doing. 
And I, was, I, I didn't do a lot of this yet, the identity. We're going to talk about that today. But I did go to what we do says a lot about what we believe about who God is and what he's done. I did it with my kids. Okay? Now, I did a little bit of the identity stuff in terms of them being ashamed, them being blamers. Now, I was dealing with identity, but I'm going to go further now in this session. Okay? Uh, so, uh, any questions? Any thoughts, feedback, clarification? Yes? A believing and trusting would be all in these categories. What I believe about who God is, what I believe about what He's done, what I believe about who I am in Christ, leads to what I do. So it's James, I know what you believe by what you do. So I can see your actions and see what it tells me what you believe about God, what He's done, and who you are. And that's what I was doing with my kids in the game. I could see their faith being worked out of their actions. And so what we do is very important. It's the indicator of what we believe. But we don't want to change behavior so that we'll change belief. We have to see belief change so that behavior will change. And that's biblical repentance. Biblical repentance is saying, obviously you don't either, either don't know what's true about God, or you don't walk in belief about what's true about God. I always say to our people, you disobey either out of ignorance, unbelief, or outright rebellion. So either you don't know the truths of the gospel, we need to preach them to you. Or you don't believe them, but you know them. Or you're absolutely rebelling against them. Those are your options. So what we need to do is proclaim the gospel, call you repentance, which repentance isn't change of behavior, it's change of belief. Biblical repentance is change of belief. It leads to change of behavior. But it's the mind and the heart being changed about who's God around here and what he's done. And when that happens, it leads to a change of behavior. But most often we put most of the pressure on getting people to change their behavior, which means they haven't changed. That's right. They've just found a new way to make you happy with them. They found a new way to fit in or to, to join the culture. And in, in a lot of ways, we have people who are no different than the Pharisees. They just figured out what looks good around here, and they do it. And that's not transformation. That's not discipleship. That's religion. It's empty and devoid of power. We don't want that. So, so you got these questions. By the way, this, I think, is a different way of reading your Bible. I'd encourage the people, that if they've learned... Bible study methods, and I'm not trying to like tear apart the people who built a lot of work on Bible study methods. I just think they're lacking, and I'll tell you how. Because what they do is they say, what does the Bible say, what does the Bible mean, and what should we therefore do? It's a very man-centered way of looking at the Bible. We should ask, what does the Bible say about who God is, and what He's done, and who we are, and therefore what should we do? Amen. Now we still need to ask, what does it mean? I'm not getting away from that, but... When we get to what it means, it better be, what does this mean about God? What does it mean about what He's done? What does it mean about who we are? That has huge implications. And we'll, we'll talk about that now. Okay. There's a hand up there. Yeah. I was, uh, in your discussion last night about your kids, yeah. I was trying to figure out if there was some point in time crisis in the past where your kids uh, came to a place of trusting and relying upon Christ. Uh, was there a time when there was... You have been saved for your older two of these. Uh, I wasn't quite picking up on that. Mm -hmm. And I would hate to see us believing something about people that hadn't actually happened. Yeah, both of them have made a public profession, have made a profession of their faith in Jesus as the one who died for their sins. Yeah. Now I'm just gonna tell you, I'm not convinced my son has been regenerated yet. Okay. But I can't tell for sure. And I think we have to be careful about like drawing that line of when we think it is. But I'm treating him as though he is because he says he is. Yeah. So, my youngest daughter has not come to that place. Okay. So, so yeah. So, and she's five. You know, and so she's still. Now, I know five year olds can come to that place. Mine just hasn't. Mine is really rebellious. And, I mean, I, I just told my wife, like, my oldest daughter's going to struggle with self righteousness. My youngest daughter's going to struggle with, I don't really care what you think. <laughs> you know, that's it. <laughs> so, she's the, she is the epitome of license right now. So I do talk to her about, uh, about standing before God. I do talk to her about condemnation 